It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral calls for the summer. A colonial mansion, a hereditary estate, I would say a haunted house, and reach the height of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. Still I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it. Else, why should it be let so cheaply? And why have stood so long and tenanted? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. Click. All right. All right. Done clicked. Done clicked? Done clicked. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready for some gill man? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Are you <laughs> ready to talk about Charlotte? I don't think that's how you say her name. Charlotte Perkins Gill, man. Are you ready to, to see some yellow? This is terrible. I don't know. what I, It's been so long since we've introduced this show. <laughs> what, it's been like 100 years? Yeah, about just about 100 years. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if you're listening to this show in real time, we took a few weeks off just for like various I think it hasn't been a few weeks. It's been a few weeks at this point. No, it hasn't. It's been longer than everyone wants, and that's okay, because we were doing our own things. But I don't even know what we were doing. I don't know what we were doing, but we were back with Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, the most famous short story that we've ever covered. Yep. I think that this is probably my favorite story so far. Yeah, it's a good one. So, were you... You've you'd read it before, right? Yes. Yeah, this is a common story to encounter in a school setting. I didn't encounter it in a school setting. This is a common story to encounter outside a school setting. Yep. Yep, just like you did. Yep. Uh, well, what did you read it? How did you come across it? I knew it existed and I wanted to read it, so I picked up a copy of a, a little mini anthology that included it and I think some of her other stuff or some other stuff that related to it. I have a little anthology of hers right here. It's funny because I was like, I need to get my hands on a physical copy of this story. And then I was like, I bought it. And then I was like, wait, I have a physical copy of this story. It's called, it's called The Color of Evil. It's, or The Medusa <laughs> in the Shield. Like it was in the book that I have, but I was like, oh man, I really want to get my hands on this. So I bought this collection. I have this one. Uh, Yellow Wallpaper and Other Writings. Uh, the Yellow Wallpaper and Other Stories. And of course, the Yellow Wallpaper is like the first billionth of the book because it's a yep. short short story it is a very short story yeah uh but jam-packed yeah jam-packed with fresh goodness so before we get into what the short story is about because it's about a lot uh what do you what can you tell me about charlotte perkins gilman do you know anything about her uh not really um we're we actually in my uh, uh whatever the class is called advanced literary theory or whatever uh we're talking about this era today we talked about this era of writing today uh because we covered virginia wolf we talked about virginia wolf and i didn't agree with a lot of what she said <laughs> who virginia wolf yeah well you may not have gotten along with virginia wolf had you hung out with her no i don't think so you don't like lighthouses you don't like a room of your own i also think that she's wrong <laughs> <laughs> It was a different time. Well, speaking of wrong, uh, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Yep. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, uh, she was born in 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, her father was a very famous man. They were like related by like cousins to uh, to Harriet, the, like, the, to the Beecher family, like Harriet Beecher Stowe and all of them. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think her father was like a Beecher. Uh, so the Beecher line is in her family. Uh, pretty well off family. And then her father is like, <laughs> I'm out. And he <laughs> bails on the family, leaves them, doesn't send them money or anything. And they are flat broke. Uh, yeah. But what's funny is she ended up turning down like a bunch of like marriage proposals, mm -hmm. even though uh, they were broke. Yep. Uh, eventually, finally agreeing to marry this guy. Named uh, uh, Charles Walter Stetson, who was an artist and like Charlotte Perkins Gilman, huge proponent of women's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, also, made her made her shut up in a room for a while, and then she wrote the yellow wallpaper about it. Like, <laughs> yeah, a huge proponent of women's rights as far as that went in the late nineteenth century for a man. 
uh, she ended up actually divorcing this guy after they had a kid, which was like totally wild. Mm -hmm. Uh, She tried to have some relationships with a few women, a best friend of hers, uh, a couple other women. She was clearly bisexual. Mm -hmm. Uh, We stand a bisexual queen. Uh, (laughs) I just want everyone to know that. Hashtag girl boss. Hashtag bisexual queen. Hashtag women's suffrage. Hashtag unfortunate things we're about to get to about eugenics. But she kept getting dumped. Because these women would be like, I got to get married. Like, yeah. whether I want to or not, I need to get married to some guy. And so she'd mm-hmm. be like, ah. She finally did go get married to a guy who she seems to have really liked. Like, so that's why some people say she was gay and some people, I, 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 there's, we have her diaries and stuff. Like, she clearly had affection for this, for these men that she slept with. Um, hey, no bisexual erasure allowed in this podcast. Yeah. Uh, she wrote so many cool stories about women's rights, about the stuff women were going through. She has a really unique writing voice. Like, it's very modern. And she wrote all these, u- like, futuristic utopian sci-fi novels about, like, women utopias. Like, how the world would be a better place if women ruled the world. And, like, people stumbling across these, like, utopias. Uh, they lean a little heavily into, like... I mean, it's a perfect world because we murder all the imperfect children. We kick the people out of society who don't fit in. And that's where people are kind of like, okay, Charlotte, that's kind of interesting. But then she wrote this really famous essay uh, called A Suggestion a Suggestion on the Negro Problem in 1908, ah. where she was like, the reason that these former slaves can't get along in America is because they're not as smart as anyone except for the few who can kind of like push through their genetics. So she had this plan. She's like, what you do is you take the ones who can't hack it, you round them all up, and you force them into a new branch of the military. And that's men, women, and little children. Because they're not going to be anything but cannon fodder anyway. So we'll just get them out of the way. We'll send them to some camps, re-educate them, teach them to be soldiers. It was this whole thing. And it was actually, like, controversial when she wrote it. And, like, she was like, mm. And apparently she only got, like, more like that as she got older. She got more and more just, like... So on one hand, you have this super progressive woman who had ideas about feminism and women's rights, like, beyond where it was at the time. Like, she was just like, no, I'm going to get divorced. Women should be able to stand on their own. We should have... We should be totally equal with men. Uh, we should... She was putting, pushing ideas in a, in a very... In very well written. She was exposing things about women's health care and she was also a eugenicist she was just like yeah and then we should also decide who lives and who dies uh putting her up there with helen keller uh susan b anthony uh there is that strain of intellectualism from this era where Mm -hmm. everyone who was like i'm a progressive i believe in eugenics uh and it only really fell out of favor once the Nazis got their hands on it. That was when people mm-hmm. were like, oh, this is that bad, actually. So on one side, I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, she was of that, like, upper class, like, white. She, you know, she was like, well, this isn't going to hurt me, and it can only make things better. But also, like, she took, she's kind of like Lovecraft in a lot of ways. Like, they had a lot in common as far as their, like, views on, like, uh, Jewish people and uh, people who were not their race. Uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. <laughs> So that was the bomb I was going to drop on you about yeah. old Char Bear. <laughs> Hashtag problematic. Hashtag canceled. Well, she's dead. She's so dead. I think the, the world canceled her instead. No, she canceled her because her eugenics beliefs went so far as to believe that people who had incurable diseases should be euthanized. When she got incurable breast cancer, she euthanized herself. And she said in her letter, hey, I'm going to talk the talk. I got to walk the walk. You know what? Good on her, I guess. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. (laughs) I I guess if you're going to be a eugenicist, like, and you practice eugenics on yourself, I guess that makes you, like, squared a little bit. I don't know. She also had a lot of serious mental health issues. Yeah. And depression. Yeah. 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 But a good writer. She's a good writer. Uh, and she wrote this story. I don't know if you've read it. It's called... The Yellow Wallpaper. The Yellow Wallpaper. Phil, take home. <laughs> it says, I bought it at work. Oh, by the way, I work at a bookstore now. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it on my job. And I put this note in it. It says, Phil, take home. So I didn't forget to take it home. Because <laughs> I didn't have my bag. In any case, yes, I, bu- I have a job at a bookstore 
now I'm very happy with it. It's four hours a week. Hell yeah. Uh, anyways, the yellow wallpaper. Yellow wallpaper. What's it about? Uh, it's about a woman who I believe she's just had a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's married to a doctor and they're going to go live in the countryside for three months. No, wait. Um, she has a Charlotte Perkins Gilman had had a baby in real life. She's the one who had postpartum depression. I think this I woman. That, I thought that this woman had just had a baby because she's talking about the baby in the nursery. Am and... I wrong about? Ever... I thought the baby in the nursery was an imaginary baby. No, I thought she she was talking about like how she was glad that she was in the nursery instead of the baby because no baby should have to be in this nursery because of the wallpaper. I thought it was an imagined baby. Wait. And she has a a nurse who takes care of the baby. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For some reason in my mind, I was like, is it the baby a made up baby? No, you're right. It's, I'm totally, I don't know why in my head I was getting that confused with Charlotte Perkins Gilman's biography. Uh, it's because I've been reading too much about Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I've actually like some, a so lot of. So is de- there really an imaginary baby in one of these stories or is the, are both babies real? Wait, are you talking about Charlotte Perkins Gilman's baby? Yes. <laughs> she had a baby. Okay, so both babies are real babies. All babies are real babies in the heart in our heart of hearts. That that is that is the stance of It's Del Toro time. All babies are real babies. Hashtag baby rights. Hashtag right baby right. Uh, uh, so wait, so yeah, so uh, going back, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your blockhead father falsely <laughs> corrected you. The baby's real, everybody. The baby is real. That's not important. <laughs> it's kind of important. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, and she's, after having this child, gotten unwell. Mm-hmm. Um, but her husband doesn't believe she's unwell. Um, so he's like, you know what would make you feel better? Staying in this room all day, every day. <laughs> And she does, and it it doesn't make her feel better until it does make her feel better, and, and then she's a scary wall lady for the rest of scary. time. <laughs> if I'm gonna, I'm gonna say. I'm going to say something <laughs> and you're going to respond to it so that I can sync up these audio okay. tracks again. Okay? Yep. I'm going to say one, two, and then you'll say three. Okay? Okay. okay. One, two. Three. Great. Okay. <laughs> I just yanked the cord out of my microphone and it makes everything stop. It makes everything stop. Uh, I just uh, laughed for like 30 seconds on my microphone. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Um, I'm going to get my Back hand. Back at it, boys. Get my hand away from the table. Uh, <laughs> she becomes a scary wall. Yeah, okay. So she, <laughs> she gets put on what's called a rest cure, which was a thing at the time, which mm-hmm. basically was for women because women were considered aliens. And doctors were like, I finally figured out how to make women happy. We'll make them stay in bed and not be allowed to talk or to anyone or read anything or write anything or think about anything. This is a Rosemary's Baby situation right here. And that's what happened to Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Mm-hmm. And it about killed her. Uh, it would kill most people, I think. Uh, not to mention the fact she was a writer mm-hmm. and she wasn't allowed her journals. So her journals stop right when she goes into the rest cure. And so then everything we know about her rest cure while it was happening is from her husband's journals. Mm-hmm. And then it picks up again when she gets out. Uh, uh, but yeah, she was put on bed rest by, not bed rest, rest cure, by this doctor who invented the rest cure. And actually when she wrote the yellow wallpaper, she like sent him a manuscript of it. She was like, here's what, basically, here's what you did to me, jerk. And Good. he ignored it and continued his rest cure thing for 13 years. <sighs> So I think there's one thing we can agree on about this story. This main character has postpartum depression, anxiety, and it transitions into postpartum psychosis. Yep. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What leads you to believe that? Does it have anything to do with the woman in the wall? Uh, it's. I think it, I, well, that and also just the symptoms and the fact that she's just had a baby mm-hmm. and the symptoms and her husband's a jerk. She does gnaw part of the bed off with her teeth as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
This story is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it, anyone needs us to say that because it's a very famous short story and gets studied in feminist classes and women's studies classes and like horror novel class, like horror fiction classes. Yeah. It's terrifying. And it's also really witty. Yeah. Like, I really like the main character. Like, mm -hmm. I really like her. She's a, a charming, funny, just good writer. Like, like I said, she's it's a very modern voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the... Does she have a name? Do we ever get a name? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we get a name for her husband. I've heard her referred to as Jane, and I think that's because there's adaptations that call her that. But yeah, I don't think there is a name given to this woman. Yeah. Yeah, the doctor was Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell. We do not like him. Uh, I thought it was John. I thought his name was John. No, 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 no. The real doctor in real oh, life. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the husband's name is John. Uh, uh, but why is... A, oh. Oh, there's a maid named Jenny who yep. is John's sister, I believe. Why is the story, though, called The Yellow Wallpaper? Because in... Okay, so basically the premise is that um, her and her husband and their new kid and their nanny uh, are spending three months, I think the summer, um, at like in the countryside. Um, and they are renting out this place. Uh, and John um, is like, we need a room at the top of the house because of all the airflow or whatever his reasoning is. Um, and she's like, well, I would rather have one near the bottom of the house because I like to be able to like look outside and stuff. And he's like, no, <laughs> yeah, just no. <laughs> um, so he, he and her are staying in this, the old nursery. Um, and it's kind of a falling apart house and he refuses to renovate anything because they're only there for three months. Yeah. And the nursery is covered in yellow wallpaper. Um, well, not covered in yellow wallpaper. It's kind of peeling and a bit gross. And it's ugly. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the windows really are barred ugly. so that the kids can't get out. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a terrible place to live. And it's also probably full of mold. <laughs> right. And asbestos is bad. Yeah. Uh, she describes this room in such vivid detail. And, and, you know, understandably, because she's stuck there for a long time. Mm -hmm. But also the way she describes the wallpaper, she has that is that thing, uh, para, paradelia, para, paradelia, paradelia, where you start seeing faces and stuff mm -hmm. in th places where there are no faces. Yeah, because humans have pattern recognition in their brains and we're really good at it. We're yeah. so good at it. We make things appear that aren't there. Right. And she sees like upside down faces in it. And uh, uh, as she the longer she stays in the room, the more she starts seeing like people. There's a woman she starts seeing like behind mm -hmm. the, the wallpaper, like in the patterns. Uh, the way the light hits it makes her move. And then she starts believing there's actually a woman trapped in there. Uh, Gilman does a really good job at slowly having her descend into this state of psychosis. Yeah, especially since the story is only 15 pages long. Yeah, it's really quick. Mm -hmm. um, I have an audio version of it. It's like 30 minutes, just in and out. Yep. Um, but yeah, so she's trapped in this room. She's not allowed out. She's not allowed to go for a walk. She's not allowed to read or write or see her kid. <laughs> uh, or see anyone else. Right. She's just stuck in this room uh, the more she complains about it, the more John's like, I guess you got to stay in here longer. Uh, and she's counting down the time. Like, she knows she will get out of here mm -hmm. at the end of their stay. But it's kind of this, so it's kind of this, like, race to the clock. Like, which will come first, her getting out or her, like, completely losing it? Yeah. And unfortunately, it's the second one. Well, actually, it kind of ties. <laughs> well, I guess that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can we talk about... How much Charlotte Perkins Gilman uses the phrase creeping? A lot. <laughs> it's a good phrase. It's, I hesitate to say it, it's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Why does she use creeping so much? It's a, a good visual for the sort of like, I don't know, it's like that, the, it, it's a creeping story. There's this creeping sense of dread and also a creeping woman in the walls. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a good word. Yeah. She's talking about how it smells bad in the room. She's like, the smell is here. It creeps all over the house. Like, ugh, ugh. And the more she, the longer the story goes on it, the more she uses the word creep. And yeah, the woman in the wallpaper creeps as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she starts hallucinating. She looks out the window sometimes and she sees people out there who clearly shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, 
She ends up trying to remove the wallpaper from the walls originally to just get rid of the wallpaper, but then to like let the woman out. Yeah. Uh, she gets a rope. Mm-hmm. And that's wild. Who's who's watching this woman? Nobody, clearly. Well, people come and go, but like they're not hanging out with her. No, Jenny is it Jenny. What is her name? The sister, the the nurse. Yeah, yeah Jenny. Jenny is like, hey, what's up? Because she gets paranoid too. Oh yeah. Um, which yeah, postpartum anxiety and and, and stuff. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, and so she's like freaking out about everyone else. And Jenny, she thinks that they're trying to discover the pattern in the wallpaper. Um, right, because she's like, I seen them looking at the wallpaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's just she just yeah. Yeah. Uh, the wallpaper's weird, and it seems like Jenny and John noticed, too. Uh-huh. Well, um, as far as she's concerned, they did. Yeah, it, it's... Well, it seems like Jenny, at least, is like, this is gross wallpaper. It's getting everywhere. Yeah. Um, right, the the yellow seems to be, like, wiping off onto, like, their clothes. I think it's fungus. Yeah, she mentions fungus at some point. Uh, she mentions it a lot. Yeah. So there is also that too that like there's a like a sick like this sort of grimy sickness Mm -hmm. um yellow the color yellow is historically very common in uh weird fiction Mm -hmm. in the late 19th century early 20th century like not just yellow wallpaper but like there's the king in yellow uh there is uh oh my god there's another there's another yellow one i can't think of what it is the yellow pops up and it's usually like a sign of like a like like a a creeping evil or like a creeping miasma just like this there's that word again what creeping yeah yeah it's just this like yeah there's something about yellow in the 19th century early 20th century that just People knew what you meant, uh, so much so that the yellow wallpaper has been uh, uh, subsumed into uh, the Cthulhu mythos uh, by some writers. Simply yeah, you be- mentioned this last time. Yeah, simply because of its yellowness, simply because of the otherworldliness, it almost it. There have been allusions to it and uh, and references to it and intrusions into the story by some writers. Uh, you, clearly, the story is not. About a supernatural event. No. Right. Um I found the mold, by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, uh, then I peeled off all the paper I could reach standing on the floor. It sticks horribly, and the pattern just enjoys it. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and waddling fungus growths just shriek at, shriek with derision. Mm. So there's, a, I think, at some point she mentions a spot in the wall that's been growing. Yeah. Um, so it's like this fungus sort of is seeping in the walls and stuff. Gross. Wouldn't want to live there. She also, the the upside down faces, mm-hmm. she's like, there's a part that really just creeps me out. Where is it? Uh, oh, she's saying that the woman is trying to climb through the wallpaper. Mm-hmm. And she's like, and she's trying to climb through, but nobody could climb through that pattern. It strangles so. I think that's why it has so many heads. They get through, and then the pattern strangles them off and turns them upside down and makes their eyes white. If those heads were covered or taken off, it would not be half so bad. And that's when she starts believing the woman is getting out of the wallpaper in the daytime. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so she somehow gets a rope, and but instead of using the rope for what you think she might use it for she's going to try to use it to tie the woman up yep uh she gets she tries to move the bed she gets so angry that she can't move it that she bites part of it off Mm -hmm. and that's when you realize she mentioned like tooth marks on the bed at one point that was probably from the children who lived in the room before but then you realize oh wait no she's been gnawing on this bed like fair yeah this like this her mind is like has started going before we realized it yeah and then like at one point She's trying to tear the woman out of the wallpaper, and then without even a transition, she suddenly is the woman. Mm -hmm. And she ties herself up. I am securely fastened now by my well-hidden rope. You don't get me out in the road there. Yeah, because this is the day John is coming to to take her back. Mm -hmm. And he... She drops the key out the window, so he has to go get the key. And then he comes back up, and... When he sees her, what happens? He faints. Why? I, I, man, I don't know because he has a weak stomach. <laughs> what do you think she like tr- pooped? I don't know what she, you think happened. She's I've... been gnawing on a bed. <laughs> yeah, I can. She's just not Im- gonna look pretty. I can't imagine what she looks like when he gets in there, and how long it must have been since he went into that room. Yeah. Unless she did all that in a day. 
but yeah, she's uh he faints, but it doesn't matter because she's tied to the bed now, and so she can only creep around in a circle. She says she says Jane at the end. I've got out at last, in spite of you and Jane. Oh, so she must be referring to herself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Cause he walks in the room and he's he he says, What's the matter? My God, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, I said, in spite of you and Jane, and I pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? I love I love that. <laughs> but he did, and right across my path by the wall, so that I had to creep over him every time. So it ends with her just walking around and around, the creeping around and around the room, stepping over this her, her fainted husband every time it's just such a grotesque final image of this creepy woman and given the times she probably didn't get any actual help she went back in that wallpaper sure <laughs> so is this story a metaphor hmm i wonder is it even a meta? i don't even think it's a metaphor i think it just is i think it's a literal story yeah uh, it's a literal story told in a figurative manner she had trouble getting it published. Nobody wanted to touch this thing with a 10-foot cattle prod. Uh, they were like, nope. The reason they didn't want to touch it, they said it was too distru- disturbing, too grotesque. Uh, no, we don't want to publish it. She finally got it published in uh, New England Magazine, 1892. It's always and- New England. Yeah, yeah, always New England. And she said that she didn't intend to scare anybody with it or gross anybody out. She just wanted to expose like what women have to put up with when they get sick. She's like, you know, there's a lot of garbage going on. And this is a feminist criticism of, you know, women's health. Happily, women's health in America is perfect now. Exactly. And Nothing's wrong. Always listen to. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, we are being sarcastic. Uh, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, the story could be, is just as relevant. I mean, I hate to sound like a cliche. It's just as relevant today as it was when she wrote it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned Rosemary's Baby earlier, uh, which I assume got some inspiration from this story. <laughs> a woman trapped in a room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't doubt it. Um, it's very, some people comp- compare it to Edgar Allan Poe's work. Uh, I prefer it to Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Um, she understands women better. <laughs> uh, she was also, we can't forget, a eugenicist. <laughs> She was. She sure did love the eugenics. Uh, She had some problems. Uh, She was, as is typical for many white uh, progressives, as I said, uh, not as progressive as they think they are. And also, you know, she considered feminism essentially white upper middle class women, like up, like yeah. white middle class women in and up. Like first that's wave who, feminism. Yeah, definitely first mm-hmm. wave feminism. Amazing for what it was at the time. Yes. Uh, but it left and yet a lot. not immune to critiques. <laughs> yes, left a lot to be desired. I mean, like I say, Helen Keller was also a proponent of eugenics. Like mm-hmm. Helen Keller believed that uh, disabled children should be euthanized in many cases so they wouldn't have to go through what she went through, which seems a little hypocritical on Helen Keller's part because she ended up being a famous person <laughs> and touring the world, giving speeches and hanging out with Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I wonder if they kissed. But, uh... What? I wish I wish you could see the face that Willow just made. <laughs> Someone get on that Helen Keller, Charlotte Perkins Gilman slash fake Toronto. What are you on about? <laughs> Listen, it doesn't. It's not my fault if I am. I thought I was the Gen Zer in this call. A creative writing enthusiast. I don't know. Why. This is no. This is. This is like your Brain Injury Alliance bloopers all over again. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know who else loved this story, though? H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, I thought you were going to say Guillermo del Toro. Do you know the man who this podcast is about? (laughs) Nah. H.P. Lovecraft loved this story. Uh, I don't think H.P. Lovecraft understood this story because in Supernatural Horror and Literature, his famous essay, 1927 Supernatural Horror and Literature, uh... He says that the yellow wallpaper. Oh yeah, he refers to, he to him. It's 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 uh, an example of Gothic literature, great Gothic mm-hmm. literature. Uh, so before we talk about Lovecraft, from a Gothic perspective, doing a Gothic read on this story, what are your thoughts? I can see it. 
Um, it it has that um sort of we talked about it a bit with some of the sort of gothic esque movies that we watched. The um there's the character of the woman who's trapped in the like attic of the house that was like the man's first wife. It has that kind of vibe. Um, and it it has the sort of a, the house that exists as a house, but is also like a prison. Um, the yeah, I can see it being gothic. Uh, yeah. So a lot of a lot of horror writers in the early part of the twentieth century, especially before she uh, Gilman, kind of faded into obscurity. Besides, you know, besides people who kind of like the yellow wallpaper, uh, she was really rediscovered in the seventies. But Lovecraft was a huge proponent of this one story. Uh, but he says the yellow wallpaper rises to a classic level in subtly delineating the madness which crawls over a woman dwelling in the hideously papered room where a mad woman was once confined. H.P. Lovecraft, my man. I'm like, oh, he uh, thinks not the my woman... man. Because you're a horrible racist, but my man. <laughs> he thinks the woman in the wallpaper was really there. I guess that's a read you can do. Sure, you could you could read it as a real ghost story. But he's like, oh yeah, it's a story about a woman who gets confined into a room and there's a ghost of a, of a woman who was previously confined in that room in there. And I'm like, oh, you just didn't, you just kind of missed the whole point of the story. To you, it's a scary story. It's not about stuff people actually are experiencing. That's about as, as good of a read as I expected H.P. Lovecraft to do, to be <laughs> yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah, but he and Charlotte Perkins Gilman would have gotten along pretty well. I think they would have hated each other. I think he and Charlotte Perkins Gilman would have started talking about... I don't, I don't think they could have stood each other. ...immigrants and would have just had a grand old day at the bar. <laughs> I think they could not have stood each other for even more than a second because they're too similar. That's true. They would have butted heads. They would have been like oil and water. And uh, also, she was a first wave feminist. <laughs> Yeah, but he really liked hanging out with women. Like he really liked women writers and stuff. He was he was an odd duck. But what's funny is Lovecraft used to get the like it was a different time pass, but now people are like Lovecraft was a racist and a horrible person. Charlotte Perkins Gilman still gets the it was a different time pass in a lot of modern writing about her. They're like but some of her thoughts, of course, didn't age that well. And I'm she like, was a eugenicist and also a racist. Can we just, she, we can admit that, right? She was a racist, eugenicist, anti-Semite. At least H.P. Lovecraft married a Jewish woman. <laughs> I don't think that's a good... <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit up there. She had some vile opinions, but, uh, 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 but she still gets that weird pass. I think because she actually like pushed feminism forward, whereas Lovecraft like pushed like monsters forward. <laughs> Goblins, he's like gobbly ghouls. I've given the world ghouls. <laughs> you have to look past my racism. Uh, uh, but people love this story. Like I said, the story it's a great is story. Still, said yeah. Go out and read it. Like it's you can find it for free to read online. It's such a quick read. You can probably sit and read it to yourself in fifteen minutes. Do you think that she intended for this woman to be euthanized at the end because she's a eugenicist and this woman's mentally ill? Uh, no, because she wasn't. So she's, I, th I bet it's one of those things where she's like, I personally did this thing so anyone can. So this is the, like. But she clearly didn't believe that in the end. Well, no, she, she believed in it for people with incurable, like, okay. physical ailments. Uh, is that better? I don't know. <laughs> this story is so popular. It has had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like, like ten different radio adaptations made of it. Two starring Agnes Moorhead, like a decade apart. Uh, it's had one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven or eight stage plays based on it. There have been. It was adapted into short films. Uh, it's been adapted into t like episodes of Masterpiece Theater. Uh. It was adapted into a short film called Confinement in 2009. Uh, there's a feature-length film called The Yellow Wallpaper that came out in 2011 that I didn't bother watching because uh, it's not. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with the story. It deals. It kind of makes Charlotte Perkins Gilman one of the characters. It's very strange. Uh, there's a there's an experimental film called Rules of the Game that was inspired by this, and then there's another feature-length adaptation called The Yellow Wallpaper, that premiered in 2021. Uh, so yeah, people are just, people are wallpaper crazy. They love it. I would love to see 
the yellow wallpaper done on the next season of Cabinet of Curiosities. Well, that brings me to the one of the last things that I wanted to bring up was the last story we read, Shalkin the Painter, mm-hmm. which I don't know if you remember. I do remember. Was called by David G. Hartwell like a like a progenitor to this, like a like mm-hmm. a an early version of the yellow wallpaper. Why do you think he said that? Well, okay, so it really when comparing the two stories, they don't have a lot in common, but right. it. It felt a lot like Shalk and the Painter was, if we were going to put this in the universe of the yellow wallpaper, was the man, the, the, the was John's POV. Hmm. Um, specifically during the, um, the scene where she comes back and is in the room, uh, and then gets, they both leave the room and she starts like screaming and gets kidnapped again. Yes. That scene was really reminiscent of the yellow wallpaper in my opinion. Uh huh. Or the yellow wallpaper was really reminiscent of that scene. Um, but I can see how both of them sort of have similar themes of uh, uh, men doing what they think is is what they think is best for women and not listening to them. Yeah. Um, and that sort of confinement and not eating or drinking or sleeping. Um, so I can see how they they connect. I do think that the yellow wallpaper did it better. Mm. Um, per- probably because it was written by. Shulk and the Painter wasn't written by a woman, was it? No, that was no, Sheridan yeah. Lafanu, yeah. Um, and also because it, this is the, this, the type of writing that the yellow wallpaper uh, is, is um, very reminiscent of, of some of the stuff that I've read for my other class. Um, it's very much that sort of, uh, uh, it's you get into the head of this person and that is where you stay. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it's technically called, but theory of the novel, everybody. I'm a <laughs> pretentious nerd now. Uh <laughs> 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 um but it, it reminds me of um speaking of virginia wolf the opening to mrs dalloway okay we read the first couple pages of that which i hated <laughs> <laughs> um this felt a lot less uh all over the place than that did um but it's it's a style of writing that i think is very interesting and i mm-hmm. think does really well for for these types of stories which is what i think shulk and the painter was kind of missing out on because that was very much of an, an outside view of a situation that was happening yeah um and i think that this sort of internal dialogue and uh setup is is a lot better for this kind of story well this story was one of her earliest um mm-hmm. short stories uh she had a magazine called the forerunner that ran for years, several years, that she wrote every article in every issue of. And that's where she published a lot of her novels originally. But before she wrote The Yellow Wallpaper, she wrote this short story called The Giant Wisteria. Mm-hmm. That people were like, if you've read The Yellow Wallpaper, read The Giant Wisteria. You'll see like where she took some ideas and refined it into The Yellow Wallpaper. If you haven't read The, the Giant Wisteria, it is a fun, fun read with some great fun characters. Uh, but it covers, it's as if... It's as if the yellow wallpaper, it's like a sequel to it all, almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can almost read it as like, what happened 200 years after the yellow wallpaper? Why it's called the giant wisteria. Give it a read. Uh, it's it's a supernatural story, but it's and it's also it's a it's maybe shorter than yellow wallpaper. But if you have a, if you have it in a collection, give it a read. It's it, it covers some of the same ground. Uh, it definitely deals with a confined woman. Uh, having their, her, you know, her, uh, what you call, what's it called? Your, your, uh, the ability to control yourself, the ability to can do what you want to do. Your free it is will, co- free your will, I guess. Uh, sure, your uh, something or other taken away, your je ne sais quoi taken away from you. Um, uh, and it's it's worth it's worth checking out. Do you think Guillermo del Toro likes the yellow wallpaper? I probably yeah. <laughs> I, c- I can't imagine why he wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, I can't. I don't know if he's ever... Mentioned it. Talked about it. But I know that he's d- announced that his next movie is uh, supposed to be, I think, The Very Giant, uh, which I think was one of the stories we discussed when we years ago when we talked about like screenplays of his that never got made. Uh, but he's never mentioned The Yellow Wallpaper. <laughs> uh, it does kind of... There's some similar themes in The Yellow Wallpaper to the... Um... Is it the orphanage? Is that the movie about the the woman whose son disappears and then it turns out that he was dead behind the wall the entire time? Or in the basement, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Spoilers for the orphanage. Yeah, yeah we covered that years ago. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, you're kind of SOL. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, there's very it, it, there's a similar vibe in that one to to the yellow wallpaper. 
that makes me think he would appreciate the story. Yeah, I could see them adapting it for a Cabinet of Curiosities episode. Mm-hmm. I'd be worried that they would indulge themselves a little bit too much. Um, I would I would want to see something closer to like the final episode. Yeah. Uh, than like, say, the one about the woman who falls in love with a monster made out of beauty products or whatever that well, one was i was thinking more along the lines of the uh the witch the witch dreams episode. of the witch house yeah <laughs> as would... long as the husband is played by rupert grint yep <laughs> everything will be fine and the actually is... can can jane be played by rupert grint <laughs> yes yes please 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 um but that's the yellow wallpaper yeah, but Charlotte Perkins Gilman, give it a read. Uh, it's it's, it's worth it's worth reading. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's I I am serious when I say it's one of my favorite short stories, and I think it's probably the the most succinct, just tightest story in this collection so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we don't know because we haven't finished. Because what is the next story in the Dark Descent, the Medusa in the Shield? A rose for Elmo. Wow, a rose, a rose for, for Emily. Elmo <laughs> by William Faulkner. <laughs> A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner, <laughs> old B. Falk himself, Billy the Falkster. A Rose for Emily. I think I've read it, but it's been a long time. Uh, Psychological rose. investigation in the gothic mode. The gothic a la mode. Uh, yeah, 1930s A Rose for Emily. According Why do to... you think this story was in the psychological section of The Dark Descent? <laughs> <laughs> What, the yellow? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> get, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, but that also ends our uh, wall trilogy. Our uh, wall. Within the Walls of Tyre, Syntilogy? Rats in the Walls, Quintilogy? Yellow Wallpaper. Three walls, my friends. And now we begin our Emily duology because we're reading A Rose for Emily. And then a few stories later, My Dear Emily. Emily gets a rose and a letter. She gets. She... She does. She gets a rose (laughs) and a letter. And you'll be happy to know that my dear Emily, written by a woman. All right. Written by a woman. Let nobody ever claim that we are not hashtag girl bosses. Hashtag girl boss. Hashtag gatekeep. Hashtag gaslight. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag I am Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's hashtag Del Toro time. time.